Hello, everyone. Um, thank you guys all for joining us for our weekly Hanama Bay Education Program Hanama Talk Series. Um, today, we are featuring um, the Voice of the Sea uh, with Kanisa Serafin, and she'll be um, introducing a few of our researchers uh, episode on cesspools, cesspool issues rising. Um, there's going to be a short uh, questionnaire at the beginning. Um, and they're going to watch the episode 25 minutes. And then there's going to be a post survey of that episode. And at the end, we're going to wrap it up with a talk story session with some of the panel researchers that we have. Um, so without further ado, Kanisa. Aloha. Welcome, everybody. I just sent out the poll, so you should be able to see that and answer those questions. There are just five multiple choice. Uh, it's it's optional. We can't make you do it, but we really appreciate it, your feedback. And then you'll see the same five questions at the end of the episode. Um, and we're going to go ahead and start the video at 2.05. So we just have a few more people in the waiting room, which we've organized to make sure we don't get Zoom bombed or anything today. It takes a little bit more handling to let everybody in. And I'm just going to repost the same message in the chat because those of people who just joined won't be able to see my previous message. So for people just coming in, more, more. <laughs> for people who are just coming in, we have a pre-survey that's five questions, which we'd appreciate your input on. And then we'll go ahead and start our video at 2.05. Following the video, you'll have a chance to talk story, ask questions of our expert panel. But during the video, you're welcome to also ask questions in the chat. And so you can interact that way. And if you're not familiar with Zoom, the chat box can be found in your panel and it, to open it, you just kind of click the little message looking icon and it'll open the chat box. Great to see everybody today. We appreciate you all joining us. Mm -hmm. An issue, the cesspool issue, is something that I think everybody um, on the panel for sure, as well as the Hernama Bay folks are really interested in and have been studying and, and looking at for some time. So we'll get to talk about the issues, how we're studying it and some of the solutions. Okay, just um, two more minutes in the chat. 
I just pushed out the link to our, our episode website page, which has other materials as well as curriculum links, but it also has links to watch the video. So for some reason, if your bandwidth isn't good enough while we're watching the video through Zoom here, you're welcome to use that link and watch it with or without subtitles, probably in a separate screen, and that way you can still keep your Zoom going. Um, or if you need to, you can rejoin us in 25 minutes. But that way everybody should get um, to be able to view the video. So for those of you who just came in, we have a short pre-survey that you should see as a poll up. It's five multiple choice questions. And then we're going to start our video here. I'm pasting again the link into the chat box in case you have trouble viewing through Zoom and you'd like to watch it in a different browser window. And without uh, further ado, I'll go ahead and start our video. This time on Voice of the Sea, we're learning about the link between cesspools, groundwater, and the ocean. Research shows direct connections from cesspools to contamination in our groundwater and the nearshore environment. Hawaii has more than 88,000 cesspools discharging over 50 million gallons of waste each day. And many of the cesspools are concentrated in low-lying coastal zones, making these areas extremely vulnerable to damage from chemicals, disease, and excess nutrients. We start off talking with groundwater inundation expert, Dr. Shelley Habel, to learn more about how ocean water and groundwater interact near cesspools. So each cesspool needs about 15 feet of unsaturated soil space. So that's the distance between the ground surface and the groundwater. The idea there is that pathogens get cleansed as it kind of trickles through that filter. We were simulating levels of groundwater, so we could see by comparing that to the elevation of the ground surface, how much unsaturated soil space you have. The Department of Health has a GIS layer that shows where the cesspools are located. And so we just overlap that with our data that we had to figure out what cesspools didn't have that 15 feet of unsaturated, feet of unsaturated space. space. And we found that the vast majority of cesspools now don't have the required amount of unsaturated space for them to be considered effective. And how is that going to change as we move into periods of higher and higher sea level? So obviously as, as uh, sea level comes up, groundwater floats just like a boat on that seawater. And so it'll come up, it'll lift up. And so that unsaturated space will narrow and so we're going to see more and more areas where, yeah, you just don't have that, that necessary amount of space that you need for a cesspool to be functional. And also, as sea level rises really high, there's some places where that groundwater comes up above the ground surface. So then you have that contamination on the ground surface where we're all walking around. Can you explain? That's just so scary. I, take it. I had to have a moment to think about walking around in the streets flooded with my cesspool water. <laughs> it's happening in Mapuna Puna now, actually. We not only found that the flooding that we see is groundwater, but that it is contaminated. As groundwater flows through the ground, it picks up this element called radon. If you find that radon in your puddle, that means that there's a certain amount of that water that came from the ground. So we tracked the amount of radon that was in the water as the tide came high and went low again. And so we saw this pulse of radon come up. That means that groundwater was pulsing up through the ground into those puddles. And same thing with cesspool effluent. So they have their tracers that are found within the, the cesspool effluent and we found that that pulsed up. 
as the tide came high. In your research, you identified Mapunapuna as this very like noticeable area where we get groundwater flooding. You can test it. You know it's fresh water. It's coming from groundwater. Are there other areas in the Hawaiian Islands that you think may be having similar problems just based on geology and your knowledge of flooding that might not have been tested yet? I think Waikiki. Waikiki is next. We're starting to see impacts in the form of basement flooding. And also, so roadway, it has its structure on the ground, but if you have really shallow groundwater, that structure can fail, and then we can start to see potholing. In a lot of really low-lying areas, you see a bunch of potholes, like right by the shoreline and stuff. There was a study that looked at the effect of shallow groundwater on roadway, and they found that it has more of an effect than weight and temperature combined. We presented this information to the DOT, and their minds were blown because they're like, oh my God, along Kapiolani, where we've been fixing pothole after pothole and they keep on coming back, this is likely the reason why, is because we have these really shallow groundwater tables. Next, Dr. Tracy Wigner shows the work that she and her colleagues at UH Hilo are doing to better understand the connection between cesspools and nearshore reefs. What about the influence of cesspools? How are they affecting pathogen load into our watershed. They're coming in through the groundwater largely. The cesspools, basically an open hole that the wastewater from the home goes into. And then the rocks on our islands are so porous that it doesn't take long for it to percolate down to the water table and then make its way to the ocean. And it's a particular threat when you're looking at homes that are right near the shoreline. There was a study at Waiopai I guess almost 40 years ago, now it was in the 80s, and they found the transport time was 25 minutes. Oh my goodness. And then the work we've done at Puko has shown anywhere from three hours to nine days, depending on where the house was located. In one place, my colleague Steve Colbert put the dye into his anaerobic treatment unit, and it was cracked, and they knew that at the time, but the cracks must have lined up perfectly with fractures in the rock because all of a sudden, within a couple hours, the water in front of the house started turning bright yellow. My colleague, Steve Cobra, he goes out, he has a giant carboy full of fluorescein, which is a non-toxic dye, and then he would pump it into one of the cesspools or the septic tanks or treatment units, and then he would map out along the shoreline in front of the house. He would find out where the springs were located. And then he would set up a protocol to go sample those every few hours to see when the dye would emerge at the spring. And then he would follow that for about two weeks to really see when the peak of it would come out and then when it would start to trail off. We measure a lot of the standard parameters used to detect sewage, so nutrients, fecal indicator bacteria. We also use some new, more molecular approaches, looking for a specific bacteria called Bacteroides, which is the most abundant one in the human gut. And with the nitrate isotopes, we can um, look at the nitrogen and the oxygen part of the molecules and do some modeling to figure out what percentage of that nitrate came from sewage or other sources like fertilizers or up Malka groundwater. The University of Hawaii Sea Grant College program focused on Hawaii's coasts and its communities through sustainable development, safe seafood supply, sustainable coastal tourism, hazard resilience, and healthy coastal ecosystems. Hawaii's Sea Grant. We're talking with Dr. Daniel Amato to learn how University of Hawaii researchers and local communities are working together to monitor water quality and trace cesspool contamination. You can think of the island like a large toilet. When the tide goes out, that's like you hitting the flush button. And, and all of that groundwater that may be contaminated in that nearshore area underneath the beach, near the beach, that gets flushed uh, generally into the nearshore environment. 
and as the tide comes back up, it pushes that kind of fresh seawater back up into the island and the cycle repeats itself. The big question is, is it safe to be in the water in these areas where we're detecting high amounts of wastewater? We can detect the nitrogen out there and we know that there's wastewater and that there's nitrogen derived from wastewater. Can those viruses, can those bacteria, are they transported through the sand and the sediment or they just go straight into a lava tube and fly right out at the coast? As a water scientist, I've seen all kinds of ways that water can discharge into the near shore environment. And at times it, it's a geyser. It comes up, it literally boils at the surface of the reef. And so there's areas where there's this really intense direct discharge of groundwater right in to the coastline and there's other areas where there's it basically the beach is a huge sand filter and potentially filtering out these virus particles and bacteria before they can actually enter the ocean through this sort of diffuse seepage as we call it of submarine groundwater discharge personally right now i'm leveraging the power of the blue water task force with the surfrider foundation here on our oahu chapter to tackle some of these questions and really um, provide an additional data set that will be very valuable valuable to the state when it comes time to, to answer that question of, is it safe? Is there a risk from a recreational point of view? I don't think that question has been answered yet, but I'm really interested in finding, finding the answer to that for sure. In areas that we expect there to be a fair amount of wastewater in the ocean, we are seeing it in our tracers. We're seeing it in those nitrogen isotopes in the seaweed tissues. We're seeing it in the water samples. All this work that we're doing is reinforcing that we actually have good models and the models are probably our best tool for predicting where we're going to have impacts, even if we haven't measured it there yet. How has your work been impacted by the coronavirus stay at home situation? The completion of our field work has been highly altered by the coronavirus stay at home, work at home. You can't really investigate wastewater from your house that easily. That being said, we can still make maps and models and look for trends. But yeah, we're, we're looking forward to wrapping this up. We've got a couple more collections we'd like to do on Kauai. We're you know starting uh, basically starting the analysis game right now and looking for towards writing this up this summer and having it available at least as a draft as soon as possible. I'm interested to know how our community can help with researching the water quality issues you're talking about. In Hawaii, there's uh, a few groups that are doing really great sampling. The state is fortunately underfunded and undermanned, so they really can't reach the capacity that some of us would, would like them to. The citizen scientists play a really important role of being those boots on the ground and eyes on the reef, where they can identify problem areas that the state might overlook and go out there and sample them and respond to events as they happen. For instance, sewage spills and things like that. We've had citizen scientists be able to go out there with a moment's notice, take a sample and run it. And this has led to a, a pretty good relationship with the state. If I notice that my river, my local beach seems more polluted than it usually is, or I'm just worried because it's chronically polluted, how can I get involved with one of these citizen science groups? If you were on Oahu, I would say you'd probably end up emailing me at the Blue Water Task Force uh, Surfrider Foundation Oahu chapter and say, hi, my name is, and I think there's a problem over here, and I'm willing to help uh, if you will show me what to do. And that's usually how it starts. We have, you know, concerned citizens that call us. I will personally train citizen scientists on how to take water samples. Right now, we are very blessed to have access to the Koala Marine Laboratory in Kaka'ako. That's a UH Marine Laboratory to do our work there and run these water samples. What our research is basically telling us is that our modeling is the best tool that we have. All the water quality uh, results and the seaweed results, they're basically just validating the model and saying that the model is predicting where we're going to find wastewater really well, where we're looking for it. So we should basically use that as our best information that we have right now and move forward with prioritizing these areas for upgrades. There's so many different varieties of of situations hydraulically and geologically here in Hawaii that it really requires a more fine scale approach to determining what kind of solution is going to work here and what communities are really at risk of impacting their own coastlines. There's not going to be a one size fits all solution. You know, we have to really consider the uh, unique geology and hydrology of every neighborhood that we are discussing. My mission over the next two years or more 
more with the Blue Water Task Force is to use this program to to help this Act 125 effort and the effort by the state to uncover this big question we have is are cesspools and other wastewater sources linked to higher levels of bacteria in the ocean? The big question is, is this having a long-term impact on our reef? And is it having a long-term impact on our public health? And is it a risk for our kids to be using these areas on a daily basis? And so I don't think we're going to know that answer until we really put the time in and, uh, and do a larger statewide study. One thing that we're developing through a joint effort with uh, Surf Rider Foundation, with the University of Hawaii, and a uh, private company, Diagenetics, is a near real-time DNA detector or quantifier, it's called the BioRanger device. In theory, we'll be able to get a count of fecal indicator bacteria at the beach in under an hour. We're hoping to roll this out this year. My experience from my work in American Samoa is that every major public beach in American Samoa, there's a sign in it, and there's a green happy face or a green dot if the water was good during the last round of bacterial testing and a, and a red sign if the water was, had too much bacteria. And I'm thinking if American Samoa can do this, then, then Hawaii for sure should be able to do this. I think we have a right to know as the public what the water quality is and make our own decision if we want to enter the water or not. In my vision for the future of, of Hawaii and potentially this country is that every lifeguard will have the ability to test the, the water quality at the beach multiple times a day because it changes with the tides. Every time the tide comes in and goes out, we kind of have this flushing of the island. When you have large amounts of, of wastewater being distributed into the groundwater and this groundwater seeping out in, into the ocean, most of that discharge happens like right at the beach face and especially at low tide. And so when you have even a small amount of nutrients out on the reef from wastewater or fertilizer, it can really make a large difference on the reef. It can change the entire reef from a very diverse ecosystem with many different types of plants and animals to a monocrop or what's in this case a sugar cane field of seaweed that dominates the, the bottom environment and outcompetes everything else. And in extreme cases, like out in front of Kahului on Maui, you can see organisms that may be native being very opportunistic and, and just dominating the seafloor. In one case, I saw what we call zoanthids, and they're this crazy, fleshy, coral-like organism without the coral skeleton, dominating like a, a four-inch thick, fleshy carpet full of photosynthesizing, particle-eating little things, and it's, it's a really wild what can happen to a reef if you just over fertilize it. The one thing to remember though is that this doesn't have to be a permanent degradation. We have shown some research that the reefs are quite resilient. If you cut off that fertilizer source, the reef will recover close to what it was like before and fairly quickly. We can fix this and the reefs can be resilient. We just have to act soon to ensure that we can get them back to a place that is conducive for a high diversity of native species. We are looking for a few heroes, mentors, trailblazers, innovators, a passion to change lives, spark curiosity, open hearts, and awaken minds, help students answer the question, who am I? This could be your calling, but this is no job. It's the journey of a lifetime. Be a hero. Be a teacher. We're talking with Dr. Henrietta Dulai about her work tracing pharmaceuticals and the path they take to contaminate the environment through cesspool connections to groundwater. For my part of the research, I use chemicals that are unique to human consumption. Specifically, I look at pharmaceuticals. So those are medications that everyone takes, I mean, most households, Take. And so once our human body metabolizes it and eliminates it, we flush it down the toilet. And here we go. We have a tracer and we can play detective and go and look in the environment where we see those medications pop up and appear in streams, groundwater, or the coastal ocean getting out to the reefs. Can you tell me what 
types of pharmaceuticals or medications specifically you are tracing? An example I would say is caffeine. Caffeine belongs to stimulants, so it's count as a pharmaceutical. And most households either drink coffee or energy drinks. Therefore, caffeine is a very good tracer for urban wastewater. Caffeine is natural, though, so it degrades relatively easy. So if you find it, we know we are relatively close to a source. Another medication that we look at, and it's also relatively biodegradable, is ibuprofen. Many people pop a pill for a headache. Well, eventually it comes out in a stream. Again, if you find it, we know we are relatively close to a source. Others, such as some antibiotics, are very resistant. We can follow them for many days away from their source. And so those are good to kind of map out regions where we have cesspool inputs, but you can't really tell how close to the source you are. Are the chemicals something that we should be concerned about being in our water bodies, or are they more just indicators of cesspool leakage? And unfortunately, there are not many studies here in Hawaii, but I can cite a few examples from other places. For example, there has been a study looking at corals that if they are exposed to caffeine, then they become less resistant to coral bleaching and are not able to fight the high temperatures. Other studies looked at the effects on ethyl estradiol, that synthetic estrogen found in birth control pills, and they found that fish populations can collapse from the exposure to this chemical. Antibiotics promote antibiotic resistance in the environment. This is all documented now. Many of our cesspools in the state are right near the shore, near the coastline, where groundwater level is very close to the ground surface. And so these cesspools are from the bottom up inundated by groundwater. And as the tide moves, it moves that groundwater level higher up, the cesspool floods, it gets flushed out, all the chemicals get out into the groundwater. And as the tide recedes, we see that groundwater loaded with chemicals flowing out and we have documented uh, this process in multiple places around the island. And I must disclose that we really focus on areas where we have high density of cesspools. So that's why we have such high levels of detection. Our frequency of detection is that we find pharmaceuticals in roughly eight out of 10 samples. That's high in, in uh, environmental studies. We really focus on finding the locations that are most notoriously leaking into the environment. Perhaps that can then inform the state which areas are in highest need of being replaced and upgraded. Our island geology is very porous because it's made up of basalt that has many conduits in it that allow water to flow freely. And so the water can travel from point A to B very relatively fast. Also, because of the relative young age of the islands. We don't have thick soil layers with lots of organic matter. Pretty much what's discharged into the rock is very little remediation happens to it. It's discharged out into, into the coastal ocean via submarine springs or to streams with groundwater discharge. Where does your research go next? We will try to see the effects of these compounds on the ecosystem, and that will be a collaboration with other scientists who study ecosystem health. And also, we want to understand more about the hydrology. Our status quo right now is that we already have spring tides and king tides that flood cesspools, but with sea level rise, we expect this problem to actually be worse because more cesspools are expected to be flooded. We have evidence that for sure, without a doubt, shows that there is this hydrological connection and chemical connection between cesspools and the environment. But it's not the problem only in Hawaii, but elsewhere. Converting to wastewater treatment plants could be one way, but perhaps how we dispose of our wastewater, a treated wastewater, is also something the state should invest in. 
Hawaii's cesspool maps, coupled with researcher findings of high nutrients, pharmaceuticals, and fecal contamination, are helping to make vital determinations about the most critical areas for upgrading our cesspools. As we work toward better wastewater management, continuing to monitor water quality is also vital to informing ocean users and ensuring public health. Learn more at voiceofthesea.org. Follow us on social media at Voice of the Sea TV. Mahalo for watching Voice of the Sea. Exploring our fluid earth is the There we go. Now you can hear me. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, everybody who's joined us and those of you who just came in. So we've finished watching our episode together and now is the time for us to talk story with our panel of experts. I've also just opened up our post survey poll. So that's the same five questions that you answered in the pre-survey. And we'd appreciate your input on those now, but you can work on them as we get our panel together and, and talk story. So I'll leave that open for a bit. Somebody just closed it. Okay, so the poll is open. Um, and today we have Henrietta Dulai, who was our last speaker in the video. We also have Tracy Wigner from UH Hilo and Shelly Habel. Uh, in addition, we do not have Dan um, Amato with us today, but we do have Mike Mezzacapo, who's also with the University of Hawaii, the Water Resources Research Center, and Hawaii Sea Grant, as well as um, Stuart Coleman, who's used to be with Surfrider. He can speak to a lot of the issues Dan was talking about, and he is now with um, Wastewater Alternatives and Innovations. Their acronym is Y, which is cool for us today. Um, And uh, so I'll invite questions, and if you guys don't, you're welcome to put them in the chat, and I will try to uh, moderate that, or you're welcome to turn on your microphone and ask them verbally. Go ahead. So I can start off with a question. Shelly, I wonder about the flooding that we're seeing now in areas like Mapuna Puna, where you know that it's fresh water, you know that you can trace cesspool contaminants. Mm -hmm. Is there a health risk to the water that's mm -hmm. in the streets there? All right, so I actually worked with Henrietta's group, um, including her grad student, Trista McKenzie on them. And so, yeah. Um, <laughs> Those puddles, it's like a combination between, there's a little bit of groundwater coming in, there's a little bit of water from the ocean that's, that's kind of flooding up through drainage conduits, because a lot of our drainage conduits work by gravity flow. So some of that is salt water coming up. Um, there's almost no water coming up and over the ocean, which is what we envision when we think of sea level rise. Um, but yeah, what, what Trista and Henrietta's group has found there is that there is cesspool effluent there. And so obviously there's likely pathogens in there that if you're not careful, if you, you, if you get that material on your hands or something, then yeah, it's a health concern. And I've actually gotten infections from working in that area. So some personal experience. There are a couple of questions in the chat, the first one is about sand filtering out the pathogens, and can they still enter the aquatic environment via rain and or tides, or does the sand filtering kind of shred the pathogens? Is that a question for me? Because I think um, maybe Henrietta would provide uh, more knowledge on that one. 
I, I will answer uh, shortly with uh, referring to studies that have been done out by Ali Boehm, uh, both in California and in Hawaii, where she actually finds that some of these get out by, for example, groundwater discharge and tidal flushing. And I, I, I'm going to pass it on to Tracy because I think she is the one who really worked on those. Yeah, so um, sand is also a reservoir for pathogens, whether it comes in through the groundwater and sticks to the soil of the sand particles or from people going to the beach and shedding bacteria onto the sands. Um, so people can get infections um, just by playing in the sand as well as going um, in the water. Um, so I think if they're accumulating in the sand, then when you do have a rain event or you have high tide coming in and then low tide going out, um, that would definitely be a pathway to bringing those pathogens to the ocean. And if I may add, uh, hydrologically, um, we maybe envision groundwater and the tidal flushing through sand, but a lot of beaches um, or, or coastlines are not necessarily covered by sand. And we have many springs that discharge directly from rocks from pretty large conduits that do not filter out the water. Can I ask you a question about uh, these contaminants and things that are being found? It's, it's, uh, it's one thing to find uh, and identify uh, a bad guy and, and its concentration, but it seems like the rest of the question is how long does this last? What's its half-life and or what will it break down into? What are the subsequent uh, molecules and their relative effect? And or the combination of those things. Uh, it seems like there's a a whole so, uh, soup full of unknowns out there that uh, it's going to take a long time to unravel. I will take the word, I assume this is about pharmaceuticals and other the pesticides and so forth. Very, very true. Um, so they kind of have dual purpose here uh, for our studies or for the focus in our case. One, we use them specifically as tracers. If you find them, does it mean you have wastewater coming in? Uh, what the concentrations are and whatnot. It's more about presence, absence. And the second one, what is their effect to the, on the environment? And so that goes into how easily they travel through the aquifer, how easily biodegradable they are. And therefore, uh, when we look at the effect, that's, that's really factors in big time. And so some are very, very degradable. They only last for um, hours or days if they are specifically very photosensitive once they discharge from the aquifer they will be degraded, but some are very, very persistent for as long as 100 days or so. And then we go into chronic versus acute effects um, in that obviously the levels are very, very tiny that we are seeing in the environment. Uh, but imagine the, the ecosystem is be, being bathed, bathing in it um, every day, every hour. Um, so is uh, really receiving uh, a low dose but over many years. So that's still the question out there, how it affects the ecosystem. And I think you asked a really good, you made a really good point, which is um, it's not just one chemical coming out, it's a combination of chemicals. So, you know, we, we typically focus on measuring one, um, but not all of them together in combination, and we don't know how they interact with each other um, because it's much easier just to try to do one at a time rather than some kind of combination and different concentrations of them. So um, that's definitely where the, you know, the field needs to go, but it's, it's quite challenge, technically challenging to do that. And then to figure out that combination effect on organisms. Tracy, can you talk about some of the work that your colleagues are doing there at UH Hilo to actually look at the effects on the reef itself? Well, we've been, we've been trying, so the, one of the big questions is, um, uh, you know, because a lot of these studies have focused on the shorelines, and, and the question is, um, are the reefs being exposed to the sewage, either uh, through that water mixing out or mixing down to the reefs or coming up through benthic seeps? And we've tried to get at that and see, like, you know, first, are the reefs being exposed to wastewater and looking for tracers like the ones Henrietta talked about, um, but also bacteria. And then trying to look for associations with coral 
coral health as well. And, and it's hard because once you get to the reef, oftentimes um, the wastewater is very diluted, which is, which is good for the reefs, um, but hard to detect. Um, but it does appear, um, one of the things that we found, and I know that they've also found this in Guam too, is um, uh, an association with nutrients and growth anomalies in corals. And there have been other studies, studies looking at other types of diseases. So in the Caribbean, they have found um, that there was a human pathogen present in sewage that was actually causing a disease that led to almost the complete decimation of um, antler coral, so. There's kind of a related question in the chat about comparing pharmaceuticals and pesticides or other mat material. How big of a driver do you guys think that nutrients are in terms of coastal impact? Well, I would say we know the most about nutrient impacts where um, when we have relatively high concentrations of nutrients coming in from a source like wastewater, um, the algae tend to grow really well. And if you remove the fish that, or other organisms that eat the algae, the algae do even better. Um, I don't think we know as much about pharmaceuticals and pesticides. We just haven't really looked into that in as much detail as nutrients. I can follow up with some comments on that. Tracy, you're exactly right. The nutrients are in a way simple because there are two macronutrients that drive those plants. And so it's nitrogen and phosphorus, just like if you were gardening, you would be adding N and P to your garden to stimulate the plant growth. And so that's um, in a way deceptively simple. And when you use the term algae here, we're talking about 550 species. So that's where we hit the complexity that in a way the pharmaceuticals and pesticides might actually convey to these issues. We have a number, hundreds of pesticides and pharmaceuticals and very few of them have actually been followed all the way through into the understanding of their impacts. And then our biota are remarkably diverse. And so that becomes a challenge. Looking at the pesticide algal interactions is not that um, well studied. So Henrietta, we have some future work to do. <laughs> um, but in a way, it's again deceptive because in part we have a, a fauna that's depauperate in the number of species. And, and by that, I only mean that we don't have a lot of diversity in the numbers of corals. Uh, species, I think, are still somewhere under 60. So if you have 60 coral and 550 algae, the opportunities for the um, the, some of these studies to actually get done carefully, fully, um, is still important work that needs to be done. I'm curious about uh, hypersensitivity. For instance, tributyl tin that salinerates uh, are particularly sensitive to that kind of uh, chemical. So when we draw on a specific uh, species and study it, that's one thing. But when we look at it in, in a whole, uh, if we don't have uh, broad spectrum uh, biota counts, how are we going to know which ones are really dropping out? Is there enough broad spectrum counting um, to identify problems rather than honing in on specific ones? Um, I'd be happy to, uh, to begin to address that, and I think that's an excellent question. Um, we have far more knowledge about the uh, distribution of corals in our coastal to moderate and deep waters because of the work that's done by NOAA in the Coral Reef Ecosystem Division, CRED is its previous name, I'm not sure what it's called these days, but also the, the Division of Aquatic Resources under DLNR, they have sites that have been built up as research sites that focus on coral. Um, and so if something were to be lost from those studied sites across the main Hawaiian Islands, one would know it. It would, there in fact have been um, concerns of losing particular invertebrates from Kaneohe Bay as well over time. But um, again, once you go outside of that fairly um, 
small group in terms of genetic diversity for coral and into other groups like seagrasses and uh, macroalgae or turf algae, um, Prestos coralline algae, we're still in a very early um, era in understanding what we truly have. And so losing something would, is my fear that we are going to lose much of what we could have that provide important trophic level um, foods for other um, higher levels because we don't have the studies, the impacts could be silent in that they won't be documented. It's a serious issue. Um, I've likened our status in uh, really where we understand algae as being like maybe if we were in Woods Hole in Massachusetts, we would, we might say that we're about in the era where they were in the 1900s. <laughs> Here we are in the, in the 2020s and we're still discovering new genera and new species. The work of Alison Sherwood has just um, been stunning in the level of cryptic diversity that we're recognizing in the plant community. And why now? Because somebody asked the question. It's been there all along, but without a focused effort to understand these, we, um, we would remain uninformed. And I, I offer the algal examples just because I'm familiar with them. I'm sure that the sponges and the other classes of invertebrates would similarly feel um, understudied. Um, and when we try to compare the levels of, um, of these pharmaceuticals that we find, um, so there are no limits on those. They are, that's why they are called emer emerging contaminants. Um, there is what's called the no effect concentration. And so how, how, how harmful a certain chemical might be for an ecosystem is assessed based on what are the most sensitive organisms are to those kind of compounds and what are the concentrations uh, at which there are not yet documented effects. And so we find that um, many of the concentrations of these pharmaceuticals that we find are actually um, about those no effect concentrations. But again, the, there are no studies for Hawaii, so we have to um, compare um, or use specimens for our, or, or, or species um, sensitivity from other studies done elsewhere. So there is a lot, there is a big gap that needs to be addressed there. Well, hello, Henrietta. Uh, we have a question about solutions and to replace ex existing cesspools? Is there support for communities that want to replace their cesspools but are not able to due to costs? And so the question is about funding being available and I thought maybe Michael might be able to give us some perspective on that and then maybe Stuart can tell us about some of the new technologies that are coming online. Absolutely. Um, so the state is working on uh, plans to create sort of a, a long range uh, upgrade plan for the entire state. And um, there is a lot of moving parts to that. <laughs> so one of the things is, is how do we support, uh, as the question asks, like how are we supporting communities who can't afford that? And I'm going to kind of leave that into Stuart, but there are new technologies that we can test and hopefully find that are available to reduce the current costs of, of systems, as well as we can look to maybe federal and um, hopefully other state funding to provide grants uh, or low interest loans to folks who can't afford the large upgrade fee that it is initially. Um, but we're hoping that the report and research that's being done that will, will come to the cesspool conversion working group will kind of give us some novel ideas on how to approach it. Uh, but what we really want to do is not just copy other solutions to, from other places on the mainland, but really look at something that is unique to Hawaii to help the Hawaiian community. Uh, because we're on an island, you know, it's, it's expensive to ship in products. Uh, and so we're really looking at new technologies that maybe could be manufactured here that will also improve our workforce and provide non-tourism based jobs as well. I recently attended a NOAA national seminar where they screened an episode or a film called Tidewater and they talked a lot about the east coast of the United States and how the flooding there from sea level rise was having an effect on infrastructure but specifically on the military and I, I wondered if 
perhaps that might be a route that we might go in terms of getting funding because I, I don't think that it's feasible, just as you're saying, just the number of materials, but in individuals having to bear the, the cost and actually getting the work done to change out our cesspools. Do you think that there's any future where we might have like overall community work to change these out and not rely on individual households? Yeah, there are some other models where there are sort of uh, fee-based systems. So instead of putting up a large amount of money to replace a system initially, uh, you could lease a system. And so then you'd have a smaller monthly payment, much like you do with using the sewer system. So that this way, that initial cost is maybe uh, uh, taken on by an entity, whether it's a nonprofit or something owned by the state. Uh, and then the maintenance is also taken care of as well. So if there were problems with the systems, uh, you could have that repaired by whoever was maintaining your system. Uh, rather than it kind of being, you know, part of your home and say like something on your roof fails and you have to repair that. Um, there are novel ways to, to look at that. Um, and, you know, one of the ways you were mentioning in the military, we could possibly, you know, if there are homes that have cesspools on those land, uh, work with them to try to develop new solutions and, and figure out um, ways or test pilot programs there because uh, sometimes they can be very innovative in terms of, uh, you know, leading uh, on a technology or something like that. And then we could bring that pilot project to homeowners on the various islands based upon results and, and research. My name is David Tarnas. Uh, uh, my community includes Puoko, which is a neighborhood that has a lot of cesspools and the near shore water has been shown to be contaminated by the cesspool that is uh, flowing in the water that's flowing in and out of that, those cesspools into the near shore water. So we've been working, and, and as the state representative, I recognize that it's in the public interest to protect the near shore marine resources and water quality. So it's worthwhile to put public money into an infrastructure to collect the wastewater and treat it. Because in some cases where the groundwater table is way at the surface of the ground, it's better to take that wastewater and treat it elsewhere. Um, and work to reduce the amount of wastewater each home creates. And so you, you, I think there's certain areas where it is worth it to spend public money, but then they'll have to go through some sort of a community-based facilities district where you know, tax increment financing can be used to finance a wastewater plant with public money. It could be paid off over time in their property tax uh, incremental financing. So there's, I think we need to look at that is a reality for some places, not the divert, the distributed, you know, uh, uh, small homes that are far away from each other. But in neighborhoods like Puoco, it makes sense that you might collect that wastewater. So we need smaller scale, uh, neighborhood scale uh, uh, opportunities. We're not sure where we're going to put the wastewater yet, because um, that begs another question about uh, that I won't get into now. Um, but I just wanted to bring that up that we're it's okay to spend some public money on this too, not just rely on individual homeowners uh, to foot the bill. Yeah, and, like and I, I was just gonna add, um, having worked a lot at Pulco too, and I think this will be true of any communities, um, when you're taking on an effort like this, even after you've collected the information, it's building a consensus um, in the community to to want to do something um, because it's it's a tremendous expense and they can't fully do it themselves and trying to find funding sources. And I, I know because we've been involved with PUCO since 2014, looking at all the different possible revenue sources um, to try to get a project like that going. And if I can jump in there, I, I kind of building on both those points, Representative Tarnas has a, a great point in that, you know, some people assume this is an individual household issue, you know, that the households have to deal with. And, you know, other people might say, oh, I don't have a cesspool, but we all are affected, you know, and, you know, take advantage of these, you know, near shore waters. 
And then when it comes to drinking water, that affects all of us. So it really is a communal issue and we have to think about it that way. And we have a number of bills. It's a shame before COVID hit, we're making a lot of progress in the legislature. And, you know, one is a simple kind of very logical idea that if you're selling your property upon point of sale, you have a mandatory inspection. And if you have a cesspool and it's leaching, which, you know, and, and affecting groundwater, then you do you have to do a conversion. And that's a great time because there's already money on the table and the buyer and seller can um, you know, negotiate this. So they're very kind of practical issues that we can use to do these things. But you know, one of the things is it affects all of us. And so we're gonna have to create a fund um, and whether that's a cesspool registration fee or a cesspool fee like a sewer fee, we're gonna to have to build up that because most of the people in Hawaii can't afford a big expensive upgrade and we're gonna to have to help them you know, with that funding process. Can you talk about some of the solutions that you guys are testing out, Stuart? Yeah, so we're looking at uh, you know, very simple kind of nature-based solutions. Um, the University of Stony Brook is doing some great research there um, in Suffolk County in Long Island where they're using these kind of um, you know, layer cake models where you use sand and soil and wood chips for denitrification. And they're generally passive systems, so you don't have mechanical parts and pumps that are very expensive, that break down, you have to be maintained and inspected. Um, and so we're building on that research and working with the university and Dr. Roger Babcock to innovate it, that even further, to maybe add biochar and vetiver grass so that we can use evapotranspiration to kind of reduce the volume of, of the effluent that comes out. And then also we have a new incineration toilet, a Cinderella incineration toilet that's going in at, uh, we're working with HIMB at Coconut Island and that's really exciting. That just is completely standalone, looks like a regular toilet, but it produces 100% pathogen free, odorless, um, you know, ash and a family of four, they might have to change this bowl of ash or empty it maybe once a week. Um, so there are all kinds of exciting technologies out there that we're just really coming into um, and, and kind of promoting. I actually looked up those um, cinder toilets after we did our interview and I'm, I'm very interested. <laughs> <laughs> really okay. cool a potty party um, so people can check it out and uh, <laughs> promote it. Um, so we'll make sure you're there at <laughs> Coconut Island when we unveil it. Awesome. I think we had one question that we missed. I'm scrolling back up through the chat. Um, so it's a question about, do we expect our reefs to recover if a large number of these cesspools were upgraded? And maybe Stuart, you can speak to that some, or Tracy, I'm not sure who's the best person. Tracy or Celia, because I mean, I know, um, as was said earlier, you know, the Dan Amato said, and the thing that, the amazing thing about these reefs is that they can be really resilient. So you. You know, we, we've seen that in Hyena when you remove a lot of the tourists and, and uh, you know, all the kind of activity on the reefs, there's been a, a dramatic recovery on Kauai. Um, but I'll, I'll defer to the scientists who know more about that. Well, I can just jump in and say that I know that the, the invasive algae that bloom in these places where cesspools are feeding their um, biomass accumulation they almost have, you can think of it like a demand. They must have that nutrient supply in order to grow. The experiments that we've done have shown that within a week, the nutrient, if we starve those algae for a week, their nutrient poise or the status in their tissue starts to decline to a point where life is not sustainable. So it's, it is actually really possible that in sh relatively short periods, not geological time, but a short biological time that we, if we shut off the faucet of the fertilizer flowing into the ocean, we could see changes in the decline of the invasive algae, which would then potentially encourage the native plants to come back. Why that's important is that they are generally the food for the fish that we rely on in these ecosystems. 
So this is actually a strategy towards securing our food supplies, as well as making the aesthetic environment and all of that to be much more compatible with what we want. The, so the hard part is that coral growth is much, much slower and not nearly so responsive as these algae. So we have to be patient and not just say it's going to be, you know, an instant fix. We have to, I think this is part of where the scientists need to, to communicate clearly what the, what the costs are, the fiscal costs, but also the ecological costs, and then the benefit and what kind of trajectory we can expect. And, and I was just going to add, it's not with regards to cesspools, but in Kaneohe Bay, when they changed where the outfall effluent was going, and I could be right, what I'm remembering is if something like within t t 10 or less years, the corals started to come back in the part of the bay where it was impacted the, the greatest. Um, so once we remove those systems and there's not other stressors, um, it, has, it does have a chance to come back. I would add to that, though, and I'm sure Tracy would agree. At some point, the ecosystem ha will have been pushed for so far, for so long, that the, the healthy adults that would generate the, the um, larvae that would settle to form new colonies of coral may be gone. And so we don't have an open, infinite window to do this. I think we have a narrowing window and climate change is driving that window to close even faster. So this is the time to do it. We have the technologies, we have enough science in back of the work that's um, being done. Um, it's really exciting as a scientist to be able to finally see that maybe there are some changes that will lead to benefits to everybody. This particular topic has been about individual cesspools and sometimes that's a home or it might be a condo or a large store or shopping center. But we also have inputs from agriculture and wastewater treatment plants. Celia, can you tell me about your data with respect to like the algal growth? Can you detect the differences between cesspools versus some of the larger sewage inputs? And then before I let you answer that, I'll just let everybody know that I, I opened up our final poll. Um, and also that I realize it's our hour is, is up. So um, I'll go ahead and hang out in the Zoom for and answer any questions as best as I can. But I understand if our, our panelists need to um, say, we oh, yeah. So I guess I would summarize that real quickly. Uh, wastewater treatment plants do a really important job of drawing down the nitrogen that goes into the coastal environment. We can still detect it, but they are among our best strategies right now. And there's a great paper by Dan Amato and Bob Whittier that explores some of that in why Manalo. The wastewater treatment plants work when operated you know, appropriately. Um, the magnitude of the impacts that we see from cesspools and agriculture are really ultimately, I think, going to be based on the density of the cesspools in an area. So if you have some places where there are every home in a subdivision that was built in the 50s as a cesspool, you should expect to see it, an impaired coastal environment downstream in the receiving waters. If you have, as with sugarcane um, up on uh, Maui's um, northeast side, uh, if you have um, substantial amount of fertilizer being applied to those fields, the um, Amato paper in 2016 showed some of the highest levels of nitrate in pore water in, in the receiving waters from those sugarcane in the world. <laughs> we set records. For the, from the sugarcane fields in those areas and the drainage that took place. And so as we have seen the, um, the decline of sugar, frankly, for our ecosystems that were being impaired by that in the coastal regions, that's a chance for us to see a recovery. Is that, that was kind of long for a short answer. <laughs> Sorry. It's a long question. Um. But I, I do realize that it is three o'clock, and so we'll go ahead and end the discussion today. But I know that you can always write to me if you guys have lingering questions, and I can help you to get them answered, or you can 
visit our episode website and find the contacts that you're looking for. Um, but I will go ahead and stay on, on the Zoom here in case people have, have questions that they want to answer right now.